Hello, fellow adventurers. Ready to embark on another misadventure? Welcome back to my channel, your gateway to magical stories. Today, we're delving into The Kingmaker's Sword, episode 11 in the Gretchen's Misadventures series by P.A. Mason. In this tale, join us as we follow Gretchen on the lamb from the Wizards Guild after discovering a stowaway sword in her infinity pouch and being accused of murder. So grab a drink, relax, and let's unravel the enchantment of the Kingmaker's Sword. Chapter 1 Gretchen recoiled as the orange brew in her cauldron burbled violently, threatening to spill over into the coals. There was a reason she only made her vermin poison once a year, and the scorched holes in her canvas smock were a testament to its efficacy. Already the consistency of sludge, it would only need a few more minutes over the fire. Giving up on stirring with her tarred paddle, Gretchen went to fetch a bucket of water and tutted at Mulligan, who was sunning his belly by the vegetable patch. You know, if your kind spent more time catching rats instead of sleeping, I wouldn't have to make this stuff. Mulligan only stretched and peered at her through cracked eyelids. In fairness, Gretchen wasn't sure if the annual batch was necessary at all, the Krampus toads appeared to be keeping the village of Edgewater free of unwanted pests, but she couldn't be sure how far they'd spread since their abrupt introduction to the local habitat. The folks in the city always complained about rats, so Gretchen figured trade would do fine, even if the citizens of Edgewater passed on their usual orders. Scraping her boots before she stepped into the kitchen, Gretchen was careful not to touch anything except the water pump in her messy state. She promised herself a long soak in the bath after the brew was finished, but knew it would be a week before the cauldron's vapours truly washed off. Piper looked up from her studies at the table and wrinkled her nose, even as she smirked. That stinks. Ha! And you said you wanted to help me, Gretchen rolled her eyes. You just keep your head in that book. Good grades mean you'll end up doing something less unpleasant for work when you get to my age. Not that the kid needed encouragement to study, Gretchen mused. Since starting at the academy, there had been nothing even close to a reprimand from her teachers that Gretchen knew of. Or it could just be that she was better at hiding her misdemeanours than Gretchen was at her age. I like potions, Piper shrugged, and I like your stall at the marketplace. Well, there's a difference between selling rat poison to the masses and custom tinctures to fine ladies of the court. If I were you, I'd be aiming for the latter. Gretchen chuckled and shook her head, then held a finger up when Piper went to reply. Gotta go douse those coals before the mixture burns. Instead of burning, a tendril of sludge hung from the rim of the cauldron and landed in a thick blob on the fire. Gretchen growled at the smoke that erupted and reluctantly stepped closer to stoop and throw water over the coals. Coughing and hacking, she dropped to the ground to roll clear of the haze chiding herself for her propensity to forego a damp mask to protect her lungs. It took a few minutes for the miasma to disperse, and in that time, Gretchen crawled to Mulligan and lay beside him to consider the neglected vegetable patch. Shame, really, she sighed, though Mulligan kept his eyes closed. I doubt anything will spring up from the ground on its own steam this year. Too much snow by far. But I could use some peas. Maybe it isn't too late to get some started in the greenhouse giving her purple feline familiar a scratch on the belly. She pushed the notion of fresh greenery aside and hauled herself up off the ground. The brewing part of the poison was finished, but that didn't mean her work was done. Taking up her tarred paddle, she prodded the sludge for pockets of air and wrinkled her nose as they escaped in popping vents of steam. The day looked sunny enough to dry out the mixture completely, and she hoped a stray shower wouldn't ruin her efforts. Getting the timing right on production was fraught. Too early in the season meant the weather didn't oblige. Too late, and the customer's produce would already be in ruins. But Gretchen smirked knowingly as she drained the gloop out into a canvas-lined handcart and wrenched the cauldron over to land upside down on the still warm coals. She'd discovered the hack to cut drying time to a third a few years back. After spotting threatening clouds off in the distance, she figured the heat of the cauldron should work just as well on the outside. Even then, she'd only just gotten the gritty substance bagged and into her garden shed before the skies opened up in torrential rain. Using the paddle much like a spatula, 
She spread the orange gloop over the upside-down cauldron in the way one would frost a cake. With broad strokes, she soon had the mixture distributed evenly and tossed the paddle into the handcart to clean up later. With hands on her hips, she arched her back with a crack and winced. All right, now it's definitely time for a cup of tea. I'm afraid not, came a reedy voice from behind. Gretchen jumped and swivelled, expecting to see someone standing over her shoulder, but nobody was there, and Gretchen screwed up her face, trying to place the voice in her mind. It was definitely familiar, but without a face to put it to. Apologies. I've had to take liberties with your familiar to convey a message. Mulligan wandered over from his resting spot and sat to look up at her. Gretchen almost jumped out of her skin when he opened his mouth to speak. Terribly rude, of course, but I had no choice. You are in danger, and I must insist you take your ward and flee that cottage of yours. Gretchen leaned down to stare into Mulligan's eyes, but other than the voice, there was nothing else to indicate possession, but the voice had found its place in her recollection, and instead of fury, Gretchen felt fear. Elod, she whispered, why are you talking through my cat? I had no other means, Mulligan's stern stare was off-putting. I am detained in the wizard's tower. You must leave at once before the arcane constabulary arrive. Gretchen's mouth worked, wondering if this was some kind of elaborate joke. But Elod wasn't the trickster type, so she asked the next pertinent question. But what have I done now? And what could my affairs possibly have in common with wizards? The pouch. Elod nodded through Mulligan's feline features insistently. They seek what's inside. The what now? The conversation was making less sense to Gretchen by the minute. I won't pretend there aren't a few odd pieces of contraband in there, but nothing to bring the wrath of the Wizards Guild down on me. Nothing you stowed inside, I assure you. I put the sword in there myself for safekeeping. Never did I imagine Morath would presume to revive interrogation practices such as... A sword? Gretchen shook her head. Nope. If there was a sword in there, I'd know about it. I make a point of keeping anything sharp and pointy out of there after I sliced my fingers on a pocket knife. Oh, it's in there, buried at the very depths. Gretchen blinked, waiting for the other shoe to drop. The very depths of an infinity pouch, huh? Gretchen threw up her hands. Well, that's just super. I think we need to have a good long talk about that pouch. And the price I paid for it. I've still got the receipt, you know. And if I don't find a clause in the fine print which specifically mentions black market swords, I'm going to demand a full refund. Mulligan Elod yowled, and Gretchen snatched a hand to her chest. We can quibble at another time. You must leave now. I dare not linger here. The guards will do their rounds any moment. Stay away from your usual haunts. Morath will stop at nothing to recover the Kingmaker's sword, and it must never fall into his hands. Mulligan blinked and swayed and Gretchen stooped to scoop her familiar up. Elod, you still there? You can't just up and leave after a statement like that. Gretchen. Piper's voice was timid, and Gretchen turned to see the girl wringing her hands by the cauldron. Why are you calling Mulligan Elod? Well, ah... Uh... Gretchen frowned, wondering if Piper had only just begun eavesdropping or if the conversation was one-sided from her perspective. I think it's high time we take a camping trip into the woods. Mulligan's going to come with us. Didn't you know Elod's his middle name? She could tell her ward didn't believe a word of it. But Piper only frowned and nodded slowly. Isn't it still a bit cold out? Pa! Gretchen waved a hand and ushered her toward the house. What with your warming cloak and my gloves? We'll be just fine. Inside, Gretchen hurriedly packed a regular satchel with supplies. Too shaken to touch her trusty infinity pouch. If it was the enchanted item they were after, Best they keep a regular pack, just in case. Piper moved with the agonisingly slow speed of pre-adolescence, and Gretchen fought irritation and panic in equal measure, as she imagined a band of wizards descending while waiting for the kid to tie her bootlaces. She couldn't say why she'd been reluctant to share Elod's dire warning, but on reflection, the less Piper knew, the better. How long will we be gone for? Piper eyed the growing bundle of food in the hamper, set out on the kitchen table. Who knows? Gretchen giggled nervously. All part of the adventure, you see. And what about school? Piper folded her arms. We'll do a bunch of foraging for extra credits. Now go get a bag of clothes together and fetch me a skillet, will you? I don't understand. Piper narrowed her eyes. 
Why would we take a whole bunch of stuff when we could just as easily use your pouch? Lugging all that through the woods doesn't sound like fun. Gretchen had been ready for that question and delivered her pre-conjured retort. Character, that's what camping is all about. It didn't hurt me and it won't hurt you. We'll take our brooms, of course, but it's still a hike from the nearest clearing to the Mirkwood camping spot. But the rat poison! Can you just do as I ask? Gretchen sucked a breath through gritted teeth. We're walking through that door in five minutes. I suggest you use that time wisely. Piper's face fell, and Gretchen felt a pang of guilt. But every minute they wasted brought the arcane constabulary closer, and her priority had to be getting to safety. The kids stalked off to her room, hopefully to get some clothes, and Gretchen stowed a small skillet in the hamper before buckling it down. Now! Gretchen cast around and plucked a blanket from over her sofa. Come on, Mulligan. I know you're not a fan of flying, but we don't have much choice. Her familiar glared as she fixed a sling around her midsection, but didn't wholly protest as she folded him inside snugly. She'd never even considered that familiars could be possessed, and worried over the effect on her fuzzy companion. He settled into a comfortable slouch, and Gretchen patted the bundle absently. Ready? Gretchen called as she finally fetched down the infinity pouch and tied it to her belt. Piper trudged from her room with a satchel on her back, and Gretchen nodded with approval. Excellent. Let's go. But as Gretchen's boot hovered over the threshold, she scowled and turned to stare at the rug on the floor of her living room. Taking her spell book would be admitting something was terribly wrong, but she couldn't shake the feeling that if the arcane constabulary ransacked the cottage, they'd confiscate it. Grumbling under her breath, she crossed the room, flung back the carpet, and reached for the loose board that was the book's only flimsy defence. She pried out the heavy tome to take it with her. With no room to spare, she removed a clean pair of hose and undergarments from her satchel to make way and stuffed it in. Piper chewed her lip from beyond the doorway, and Gretchen only drew a deep breath as she locked the door behind them. With a satchel each and two hampers, Gretchen decided on using both brooms for the trip, despite the sluggish speed of Piper's vehicle. Being spotted in the skyline was something she'd have to risk, but if they stuck close to the forest's canopy, they could be lucky enough to avoid notice. Stay close to me! Gretchen clapped a hand on Piper's shoulder. And if we run into any trouble, you head straight for the Sultan Bog and tell Uncle Jurgen to get you to the Academy. Having taken the hint that Gretchen wasn't going to offer any more insight, Piper nodded hurriedly, her eyes glistening with fright. Chapter 2 In the rocky outcrop deep in the woods, Gretchen sat with feet dangling over an enormous boulder, staring through her spyglass. The drop would break her neck if she fell, but she paid it no mind as she scanned the area beyond the trees for any sign of a malevolent envoy. They'd be no more than ants from her vantage if they arrived. Even her cottage was barely distinguishable from the other dwellings that dotted the green fields. Do you want the sausages or the ham? Piper called out. The smell of their dinner wafted invitingly from their campsite, and Gretchen reluctantly stowed the looking glass away to return to the tent. For three hours, Gretchen hadn't spotted a single rider approaching her cottage, but she feared in the snatches of time she withdrew her attention they could have been and gone, leaving her none the wiser. It was unlikely, but unless Mulligan started talking soon, the arcane constabulary was the only way to verify Elod's story and help her decide what to do next. That was if the whole thing wasn't some hazardous side effect of inhaling too many fumes while brewing the rat poison. Piper sat on a log by the arcane fire Gretchen had set, its blue-green flames giving off no smoke as they leapt up from a pile of stones. The tent stood erect, if a little wonky, close enough to the fire to keep them warm throughout the night. But then... Gretchen wasn't certain if she dared to keep a beacon lighting the way to their hideout. Sausages! Piper held up the skillet with a frown. Oh! Gretchen shook her head to clear the thoughts crowding her mind. Just some bread for me! Piper rummaged through the hamper as Gretchen dropped to the log beside her and after accepting a hunk, sat nibbling on it absently. Mulligan's still sleeping. Piper staked a sausage with her pocket knife and took a bite. Are you sure he's okay? 
Gretchen wasn't sure that he was, but figured she'd be exhausted too if someone had used her body as a message-conveying vessel. Her feline familiar's head was visible beyond the tent flap, curled into a blanket. Mulligan would sleep 25 hours a day if he could. He hates flying. In the morning he'll be right as rain. I think it might rain tonight. Piper sniffed the air. Smells like it. Gretchen admired such a discerning nose on a witch so young and ruffled her hair to say just that. My Aunt Esme always said a witch's nose was keener out in the wilds. It won't be long before you're sniffing out roots with the best of them. But we'll stay out here, in the rain. That's what tents are for, Gretchen shrugged. It's spring. It'll pass soon enough. Why are we out here? Piper ventured, her voice cautious as she turned the speared sausage in her hand. I know we're in trouble. It seemed mean to keep the girl worrying in Gretchen's estimation, but she kept imagining Piper pressed for information, and a fierce sense of protectiveness swelled in her chest. Better that she didn't know all the details. She wasn't much good at lying, and thankfully had an aversion to doing so. A precaution. Let's hope by the time morning comes around, I can tell you more than that. Piper opened her mouth to protest, but Gretchen stood and once again fished out her looking glass. Taking a bite of bread, she tracked back to the viewing point and did a sweep of the lands below. In the light between night and day, she caught sight of a band of riders, those in the forefront brandishing glowing torches. Crap! Gretchen exclaimed around a mouthful of half-chewed bread. She stopped to spit it out with a wince and crouched to give a more thorough inspection of the surroundings. Gretchen's cottage sat closer to the city than Edgewater, in the outskirts where her nearest neighbours were fields away. But the dusty lane she lived on was by no means a thoroughfare, and it looked like the riders were crossing directly across Farmer McBride's newly sown lucerne toward her cottage. From her count, eight figures rode close together, their speed picking up as they closed the distance. What is it? Piper spoke at her shoulder, and Gretchen recoiled in surprise. Near gave me a heart attack, kid. Gretchen drew deep breaths through her nose and held a hand to her chest. Quickly, douse the fire. While Piper went off with no argument, Gretchen sat calculating. Three hours seemed sluggish when a swift messenger could arrive in Edgewater in a little over an hour, but eight arcane constables seemed excessive for one witch caught unawares, and what were they planning on doing with those torches? Their arrival proved she hadn't fallen into madness, and that could only mean there was a sword stashed somewhere in her pouch. Darn it, Elod! She clenched her jaw and huffed. Why me? Elod? Gretchen cursed the kid's light footfalls and swivelled to see her standing a scant few paces away. The arcane constabulary are down there, looking for something I don't have. After handing the looking glass to Piper, she waited for the girl's sharp intake of breath as she spotted them. But what are they after? Not safe, Gretchen shook her head briskly and stood. As far as you know, we just went camping and I was acting odd. You are acting odd. Piper handed the looking glass back. What are we going to do? Gretchen puffed out her cheeks and spun on her heel for the tent. Talk to Mulligan. Having clearly decided that asking questions wouldn't get her far... Piper followed Gretchen back to the tent, with arms folded. Inside, Mulligan lay snoring, and Gretchen sat to stroke his cheek. Come on, Fleabag, I need information. If Elod is kicking around inside that head of yours, it's time to hand him the reins. Mulligan snuffled and rested his chin on Gretchen's arm. His expression was pitiful, and Gretchen gave him a scratch behind the ears. If Elod was lurking inside her familiar's mind, he wasn't speaking up so there was only one other option left. Leaving Mulligan bundled snugly in the tent, she untied her infinity pouch from her belt and began the arduous process of emptying it out. Piper resumed her seat on the log to watch, but Gretchen feared the effort would be fruitless. She'd emptied the thing plenty of times before and found nothing but her own junk inside. She hoped her need for the sword would summon it from its hiding place. After that, She'd gladly bury the stupid thing out in the woods and surrender the pouch for inspection. After having the pouch in her keeping for more than a year, it had amassed an eclectic collection of oddments that spoke of Gretchen's trade. More bottled potions than she recalled brewing, charmed objects, feathers and shiny stones that caught her eye, and a spare pair of underpants she'd stowed away after her visit to the labyrinth. 
but when her grasping around yielded nothing but the empty void inside, Gretchen flung the pouch across the forest floor in irritation. She hadn't even found the freezer section Elod had mentioned as a means to keep herbs fresh. Maybe we should go pick up Bertie and see if he can find it. Gretchen rested her head in her hands and sighed. That elf seemed to know his way around in there. They'll see us in the air, won't they? Piper waved vaguely toward the cottage. And they'll be asking after us in the village, Gretchen agreed. And all our usual haunts. Does that mean Uncle Jurgen? Piper swallowed. Will he be okay? Can't see why not, Gretchen rubbed her chin. But best get a message to him anyhow. Try to summon Monty, will you? It's almost dark. He might come out early. Gretchen rifled through the considerable pile of things strewn around the campfire, wondering if a note was safe enough to send. If the message was somehow intercepted, it could make it look like Jürgen was involved. But words on a page wasn't the only method of passing on a warning, so she plucked a slender, empty bottle from the pile and grabbed her spellbook from the satchel. Piper cracked an eye open from her trance and raised an eyebrow. What are you doing? Message in a bottle. Handy spell to have at your fingertips, though I never get the incantation right if I don't look it up. With her spell book in her lap, and Piper returning to seek out her bat familiar, it surprised Gretchen when she didn't even have to ask the tome what she sought. With no nonsense whatsoever, the first page held the words she needed, and she recited them carefully into the empty bottle. Once set, Gretchen scrambled to think of a cunning message. The wizard police fronted up at my cottage, heaven knows why, but I got away. I'm off to hide out in Nora's workroom at the Baron's estate, but if those goons come looking for me, you tell them I'm at the academy. Gretchen corked the bottle in haste and muttered the final incantation. Curiosity must have won out for Piper, who sat considering her. Why would we go to the Baron's estate? she asked. I doubt he would be happy to see us. We're not, Gretchen smirked. Jurgen knows we'd never go there, but those wizards won't. The Academy will be the last place they look if they find the message. And if they don't find it... Piper chewed her lip. I'm open to ideas, Gretchen shrugged. The person best placed to get to the bottom of what's going on is Cordelia. Like it or not, we have to get to the Academy. Piper's brow furrowed in concentration, and Gretchen saw the cogs turning in her mind. Nora, she announced. Your message notebooks. We can get Nora to give it to her. No use, Gretchen waved a hand. I got a note from her last night, off somewhere on the other end of the continent, trying to put an entire cursed battlefield to rest. Then we'll just have to sneak in. Piper's face froze, and she looked to the canopy overhead. Following her gaze, Gretchen spotted the swooping silhouette of Monty. The bat dived in between branches and caught a bough above them to swing upside down. Flapping his leathery wings, he chittered in greeting to Piper. Right. Gretchen rubbed a hand over her face and was glad at least she could get the message off to Jürgen sooner rather than later. We wait until it's full dark and fly to the city. Land someplace out of the way and go in on foot. If the academy is being watched, I have a few tricks up my sleeve and we can go in by the kitchens. Piper's eyes gleamed with a kind of excitement, but her attention turned to Monty. Likely the kid was just happy that Gretchen wasn't putting her on the sidelines, but in truth she knew the safest place for her ward was behind the academy walls. She wouldn't put it past a wizard to take Piper into custody as insurance, and from what Elod had insinuated about interrogation, it seemed wizards were even less scrupulous than usual. The sword must be mighty important, or dangerous, perhaps both, but nevertheless... Gretchen summoned a smile as Piper coaxed Monty down and helped to fix the bottle to his claw with a leather thong. After stroking his belly and whispering instructions to her familiar, Piper shooed him away into the dusky sky with a giggle. The bat took wing, and Gretchen let go of a breath she didn't know she was holding as he swooped off into the general direction of the Sultan Bog. The business of cleaning up was next, with the litter of junk from Gretchen's pouch strewn about. It would be an awful thing to lose such a valuable item, Gretchen mused as she stuffed odds and ends inside. The contents represented just how far she'd come since selling the odd cure in Edgewater and waiting for people to turn up at her door. Without the enchanted item, her whole business model in the city would be in tatters. 
She didn't want to think of how that would bode for the relatively comfortable lifestyle she enjoyed, or how she'd feed two mouths in her previous financial state. Should we go now? Piper asked, glancing up at the darkening sky. Let me just go check on those nosy so-and-sos. Gretchen gripped her looking glass, marched over to the boulder, and stooped as she approached the edge. Through the glass, she saw the lane by her cottage with horse-shaped blobs standing around, but at least the cottage wasn't ablaze. They'll be searching, Gretchen thought, or at least overturning every piece of furniture she owned while waiting for her to arrive home. It couldn't be long before one of their party sent word back to broaden the search, and her only edge was that they didn't know that she was aware of their intentions. All right, Gretchen tucked the looking glass away and returned to the campsite. There's a crest a few miles east, then the land slopes away. We'll have a fair chance of getting out unnoticed. I think we either leave now or stay here for a few weeks waiting for Nora to get back. Piper petted Mulligan, who lay snuggled into her lap. The worry on her face mirrored Gretchen's concern. He needs somewhere warm and maybe a checkup with the familiar handlers. Gretchen fixed the sling around her shoulder and took the feline with a croon. That settles it then. Mind your step in the dark. The last thing we need is cause for bone setting while scuttling around like fugitives. Chapter 3 Instead of their usual landing spot in the city's stables, Gretchen led them to a ramshackle arrangement of buildings outside the walls, where the poorer folk dwelled. Every now and again, Gretchen had offered her services to the elderly and decrepit when she had a surplus of potions that weren't selling. In a squat, mud-brick hut, she found an old woman she'd tended, coughing over a meagre fire. Good grief, that sounds awful. Gretchen wrinkled her nose as she set a hamper down and closed the door behind Piper. I told you to come and see me if the cough came back. I'm old, the woman wheezed. I won't put off the inevitable. You put those medicines of yours to use on younger folks. I'll not be greedy with an excess of years when young Eustace's little one has a rattle in her chest. Piper stared at the woman, who looked older than the entire witch's council combined, and Gretchen tutted as she rummaged in her pouch for a tincture. The years wore heavier on those who had to work hard to earn them, and no doubt the illness of the lungs came from insufficient warmth in the house. Here. Gretchen blotted some oil on a kerchief and handed it to the woman. Keep inhaling that to ease your breathing. I'll leave you the bottle, along with something that'll clear out an infection for the little one. You have my gratitude. The woman bobbed in an awkward curtsy. And what might I do for you, mistress? Her dim eyes evidently hadn't missed the satchels and hampers they'd brought in, and Gretchen set the one with the food down on a rickety table. I need some place to store my stuff. In exchange for keeping it safe, you can have the food. Trade some for extra peat. That tincture won't do a thing against the cold. The woman grunted agreement, and as she rifled through the basket, Gretchen pulled out her spell book and tucked it awkwardly inside the sling with Mulligan, that she wouldn't leave with anyone. You are a blessing, the woman exclaimed as she sized up her score. Never mind that. Gretchen clapped a hand on Piper's shoulder and turned to leave. We were never here. Don't go yammering. Gretchen only paid the woman's promises half a mind as she slipped into the muddy street. Piper cast wide eyes at men staggering by with bottles of grog and the women out in the cold, looking as though they were waiting for something. Don't the city gates shut at night? Piper asked. Yep. Gretchen wondered if they should have stayed with the old woman long enough to apply the glamour powder. But I've got a way to get into the watchtower. I'm sorry you'll have to witness it. Stopping in an inconspicuous corner, Gretchen rummaged in her pouch for the powder and did her best to apply it in even strokes across her face. It tingled, but Gretchen thought the burning of her cheeks had more to do with embarrassment than sorcery. Piper grimaced as she came into the light, and Gretchen hoped the powder hadn't spoiled. How do I look? Like one of those painted ladies you see when... Yeah, yeah, just be quiet and follow my lead. Gretchen stuffed her hat in her pouch, and after thumping on the watchtower door, a fresh-faced guard opened it. His features settled into a smarmy expression. Oh, please, sir. Gretchen laid a hand on the man's arm. My daughter and I were caught outside the walls when my mount threw a shoe. We've only just arrived back. 
Please let us in. Gretchen knew she would have stood no chance without the illusion, but sure enough she passed through without incident, and the guard patted her rump as she ushered Piper through the other side of the square building. Tempted as she was to confront the man wearing her proper face, she knew the disguise would be useful inside the walls. Instead, she giggled and gave a coy wave as they scuttled off into the city. Piper looked thoroughly disgusted at the ruse, and Gretchen gave her a sheepish grin. You never know when that kind of thing will come in handy, kid. Now come on, we'll want to approach from the back. Which meant going the long way around, with extra care taken at crossroads, where she could spot the large doors leading into the academy. Nothing so blatant as a wizard guard standing at the front caught Gretchen's attention, but her skin prickled nonetheless. Rather than use the alleyway directly by the kitchen door, Gretchen helped Piper over mounds of refuse from the adjacent boarding house, and they made it inside the academy walls with a shared breath of relief. Wait! Gretchen caught Piper's hand as she went to hurry down the hallway. Closing her eyes, she broke the glamour and wiped her powdery face with a sleeve. Piper snorted, and Gretchen gave her a quizzical look as she stuffed her hat on her head. First you looked like Harlot, and now you have smudges on your cheeks and smell like a midden heap. Hey! Gretchen smirked. You smell like a midden heap too, you know. Piper rolled her eyes, and Gretchen nudged her ahead. The girl had good enough sense to keep to less used corridors and passageways, and though there were just as many stairs to contend with, they arrived in front of Cordelia's study in the upper levels before too long. Gretchen slid into an alcove behind a statue and whispered to Piper, You go ahead and knock. Make sure nobody is in there with her. It took a full few minutes for Cordelia to answer, wrapped in her dressing gown and wearing knitted slippers. Thank goodness, I was wondering. Just us! Gretchen slid out from her hiding place and shrugged. Apologies for the late night visit and all, but... Get inside, quickly! Cordelia hissed. That didn't sound promising, Gretchen thought as she bustled in. The door to Cordelia's private apartment stood open, with only the flickering, dull light of the hearth illuminating her study. I've a warrant for your arrest. Cordelia grabbed a sheaf of parchment from her desk and clicked her fingers to activate the light charms in wall sconces behind her. I would have called an emergency council meeting, but decided I could hold off until morning. Great. Gretchen seethed as she sat on a seat across from her. Mulligan stirred in his resting place and she reached into the sling to give her familiar a scratch before plucking the spell book out. What have those nitwits come up with then? Espionage? Theft? Illicit trading? Murder, Cordelia stated flatly. Gretchen almost dropped the spell book on Mulligan's head in shock. This alleges you slew E. Lord Firemount in his place of business and was seen stashing the murder weapon in your pouch. No, she didn't, Piper cried. That's a load of... No need to foul your mouth with profanity, Piper. Cordelia gave her a stern look. Not even the Grand Wizard himself could convince me that my sister is a murderer. But you must tell me everything. Never in my time has a warrant arrived at the Academy from the Wizards' Guild. Elod isn't dead. Gretchen's voice sounded wooden in her own ears. He's in the tower. But if they're saying he is, that doesn't bode well for him. Cordelia only cocked her head and Gretchen plucked Mulligan from of his resting place. He sent me a message, through Mulligan, told me to flee the cottage before the arcane constabulary arrived. This little guy hasn't been the same since. She caught herself staring at Mulligan's dozy face and blinked. Elod sold me an infinity pouch a while back. What I didn't know at the time was that he left something in there for safekeeping. Cordelia rounded her desk and took Mulligan into her arms. With shrewd eyes, she poked and prodded, then pressed her lips into a thin line. He needs to be seen right away. Piper, take him to Harriet at once. Tell her, well, just say it was a spell gone wrong. She'll give you a talking to, but she mustn't know a wizard appropriated his mind. Piper gulped, but nodded as she took Mulligan and scurried out of the study. Gretchen chewed her lip, hoping at least in part the need to get the girl out of earshot drove the haste, but knew old Harriet would see her companion right. She always did care for animals more than humans. Once they were alone, Cordelia pressed again. What did he leave in there? What in Light's name had brought the wrath of the entire wizard's guild to our doors? The Kingmaker's sword, Gretchen sighed. Though for the life of me, I can't find it in there. Cordelia sucked in a sharp breath through her teeth and folded her arms. This is beyond bad. 
that silly old buffoon, should have dropped the cursed thing in the middle of the ocean as soon as he laid hands on it. Do you mind telling me what the heck the thing is? Gretchen thumped her spellbook down on the desk. I've a mind to throw the darn letter opener into a volcano on account of the trouble it's caused. Cordelia then did something Gretchen never would have expected. From a side cabinet, she drew out two tumblers and poured what smelled like double distilled witch's brew in equal measures. I've only ever read about it, of course. She handed Gretchen a glass and resumed her seat. An ancient relic, created by a wizard in a dark chapter of history when a tyrant ruled most of the continent. Its purpose was to usurp him, which of course it did, but in the centuries that followed they put it to more scheming uses. All in the title, huh? Gretchen took a swig. How does it work? Well, there was a fair bit of theatrics that went along with it. Its first use had some illegitimate heir pull the weapon from a stone. From there, he rallied even the king's most loyal supporters with glamour and compulsion. His reign went well for magical folk, but when less amiable descendants rose to the throne, witches and wizards alike saw an opportunity to pluck whichever dolt they chose to assume power. Cordelia stared into nothingness and shook her head as if caught in a dream. It created great unrest in the guilds. Witches and wizards clamoured to be advisers to the throne and whispered self-serving suggestions to the monarchy. Some kings went mad. Others took their own lives. Finally, after a fruitless war was declared with the southern continent over an imagined slight, the Supreme Council agreed the sword's use must be brought to an end. Gretchen snorted. How benevolent of them. Cordelia gulped down her liquor and smacked her lips together. Indeed, there was no mention of what became of the sword after that. I'd assumed they had destroyed it. If I could get the darn thing out of my pouch, I'd be more than happy to oblige. Cordelia frowned at the item in question and set her glass down. You never told me how you acquired such an obscure item. The question touched on dangerous territory. The confidentiality contract she'd signed for the damsel gauntlet's payday was with the king himself. Ran into some luck and brought it from Elod. Maybe he gave me a good price on account of lumping me with the stupid sword. Gretchen rubbed her eyes. I doubt I know even half the secrets inside. Do you think there might be someone at the Academy who... No. Cordelia's eyes flared. Nobody at the Academy must know about the sword. It may have been crafted by a wizard, but in our current state... Even the council would clamour for its use and our ascension in society. Gretchen leaned back at her sister's vehemency, surprised that she would speak against the institution she'd dedicated her life to. Well, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. Cordelia stood and folded her arms, then went to the fireside to prod the flames back to life. Holding her hands out to the warmth, firelight danced over her troubled face. The easiest solution would be to destroy the pouch, but that does not prove your innocence. If anything, the act would aid your prosecution. The council may insist on convening a joint trial in the matter, but they wouldn't go out of their way to ensure you were acquitted if they made a convincing argument of your guilt. They say they have witnesses. They will have chosen those with impeccable reputations. Gretchen tilted her head back to stare at the ceiling, trying not to grind her teeth. So, we can't trust anyone here and the only wizard we can trust is locked up. What then? Start a new life someplace they'll never find me? I need time to think. Cordelia peered at Gretchen from the corner of her eye. But yes, for now, hiding may be the best option. There is a change of guard, as it were, in the Wizards Guild. Morath Nightstaff is now the Grand Wizard. His reputation is... coloured, and he's been known to have a wicked temper. I'm not sure Elod has the luxury of time... What if they mean to kill him? I can't just run off and leave him to his fate. Oh, you mean to go and break him out? Cordelia rolled her eyes. Go storming into the very place they'd see you rot in. Gretchen didn't respond right away and tried to order her swirling thoughts. No help from witches and certainly not from wizards. What other magical folk could get her out of a jam like this? Dwarves, maybe. Elves. Maybe she could shrink a brownie down and send them in to poke around inside the pouch, or even risk going to Gavin's workshop to enlist Bertie's help. None of the notions stuck in her mind. She needed something bigger, a creature that even a wizard would fear. Then it clicked. Vera. I know where I should go. Gretchen stood, 
her belly a knot of excitement. But I'll have to go alone. Cordelia turned to face her and tilted her head. Should I ask where? Safer not to. Nobody will guess my location, and any fool that unwittingly stumbles there by accident would have a rough time. Gretchen thought of Piper and Mulligan, then pushed away a tinge of guilt. Piper's going to put up a fuss. Do you mind? I'll deal with it. Cordelia crossed to her desk and rummaged around in a drawer. And I'll fetch Mulligan myself in the morning in case Elod speaks up again. But I have a charm for you to take. I suggest we use them sparingly, but at least we will still be able to communicate. No need. Gretchen worried over the implications for her sister should the council suspect her. Let's do things the old-fashioned way, huh? I left some things with a beggar woman outside the city. Piper knows which hut it is. Leave any messages you have with her. I'll let you know when I'm back. Cordelia slid the drawer shut and blinked glistening eyes. Just promise you'll be careful. Course I will, Gretchen grinned. Thanks, sis. You're the best. Chapter 4 Getting out of the city was easy with another touch-up of glamour powder, though Gretchen made use of a different watchtower to entreat the guards to let her by. From there she ducked into the old woman's hut to fetch her supplies, and left the crone tucked in bed with some magical encouragement for her meagre fire. Nobody accosted her in the street. It was long past time for even the drunks to be lingering, and she sped off into the night on her broomstick, hoping her sense of direction wouldn't lead her astray in darkness. She saw the vague outline of mountains under the moonlight, though, and it was one peak in particular she sought. It had been a long time since she'd called on the dragon who lived there, but they'd been on good terms for the most part after her adventure with the damsel gauntlet. Right then, she only needed to get close enough to be out of wizard range. In the morning, she could properly find her way there. Despite the wind whipping against her face, she stifled a yawn, she wasn't looking forward to sleeping under an accommodating bush, without even the luxury of Piper's heated cloak. Her ward was going to be furious with her for leaving, but there was nothing to be done for it. She was sure Virag would be a perfect gentleman if she took Piper to his mountain. But with wizards on their tail, she couldn't bear the thought of her being caught in the crossfire. And on her tail, they would be. After ransacking her cottage, they had enough of her personal effects to try their hand at tracking spells. Gretchen wasn't sure how adept their kind were at that sort of thing, but she had to assume they had plenty of tricks up their sleeves. As much as those thoughts haunted her troubled mind, she had to concede that she needed a break when she almost crashed into a tree branch, when her eyelids lapsed into slumber. The country below was sparse woodland, and she slowed her vehicle as she dived lower into a patch of grass. The landing was hard, and she rolled off the broomstick with a wince, but her satchel remained intact, and the hamper tied to the broom kept her vehicle from spinning off into a tree. After dragging her things to a sheltered spot and draping her tense canvas over a ditch, she crawled inside and used a rolled blanket to cushion her head. It wasn't long before she succumbed to sleep with a promise to herself to wake with the dawn. But when she opened her eyes again, the full light of day greeted her from outside her makeshift tent. Darn it, she muttered as she rubbed the small of her back with a fist. Too old by far to be sleeping in ditches, much less sleeping in. Having given the old woman most of her food, Gretchen settled on a wedge of cheese for breakfast and washed it down with water. With no other creature comforts available to her in the middle of nowhere in particular, it wasn't long before she took to the skies again to seek the dragon's mountain. It was further away than she remembered it, but she guessed that was the way with most things. Not having the luxury of a portal stone didn't help matters. In the mountainous ranges which neither Helgard nor the Kingdom of Tolsha laid claim to, each summit looked the same, and Gretchen couldn't quite decide which one was the more likely candidate. But as she got closer, she settled on what she thought was the moodiest looking mountain, a little squatter than the others, and veered toward it. After her encounter with the solid wall around the labyrinth, Gretchen opted to land at the mountain's base and continue on foot. She knew dragon magic seeped into the landscape and would confound those who meant harm to wander in circles until Virag chose to dispense with them. The uphill track looked right, and by noon 
she'd come by the abandoned fort, which should have taken longer to find. It boded well for her hike, which had already taken its toll on her aching feet. She stopped by the abandoned walls to sit a while, but as she nibbled on some bread and considered the use of a wakefulness tonic, she heard the beating of wings in the distance. Her old pal evidently knew she was there, and if he was in a good mood, she hoped he would give her a ride up to his lair. It didn't take long for the elder orange dragon to touch down on the grass near the fort, and she stood to hold her arms out in greeting. Virach, long time no see. Witchling. The low rumble of his voice vibrated the ground. What brings you to my mountain? Ah, well, I was hoping you could help me with something. Got myself into a bit of a quandary. Puts me on the outs with both witches and wizards. The answering rumble sounded much like a laugh, and Gretchen pulled a silly face. I know, right, so I got thinking, and decided the safest place in the entire world to keep something would be right here with you. You offer me treasure? Virag leered, snaking his head closer. Or do you simply wish to cast off that which weighs you down? Can't it be both? Gretchen frowned, wondering whether she'd miscalculated in bringing the pouch to the mountain. I'm sure someone like you would love to add such a coveted relic to your hoard. Virag considered her for a moment his serpentine eyes calculating. Very well. Let us away to my cave, where you may tell me of your treasure. Taking his cue, Gretchen grabbed her things and scrambled up onto the dragon's back. Using her broom to balance the packs across the dragon's spine, she hoped the ride would be gentle. But Virag didn't give her much time to think about it, before leaping up into the air toward the lone tower which stood by his cave. The last time she'd gone on a joyride with the dragon, the experience had been exhilarating, but with the weight of worry on her shoulders, she cared little for the spinning, whirling and general showing off. Glad to land in one piece, she slid from the dragon's slippery scales with an ankle-jarring thud and hobbled for the mouth of his cave. You seem different, witchling. Virag trod behind her into the darkness. With a gentle gust of flame, he ignited a stack of dry wood and Gretchen sank gratefully onto a boulder beside it. Last time you graced my mountain, there was a carefree aura about you. Well, care has a way with catching up with a person, whether or not they want it to. Gretchen rested her head in her hands and groaned, and wisdom, it seems. Vera gave a throaty rumble and sank with what seemed a little like elderly strain to the cave floor. Tell me what has happened. A friend of mine, a wizard, would you believe, is imprisoned by his own guild on account of a relic hidden in this pouch he sold to me. Gretchen untied the pouch from her belt and held it up. I can't get the darn thing out of there, and even if I did, it's too dangerous to hand over to them. Meanwhile, I've been accused of murdering the guy, which makes me a fugitive even from my own order. Quite the predicament, Virag stretched out, so his belly faced the warming fire. What do you propose to do about it? Oh, well, I don't know. Gretchen waved her arms in indignation. I only figured it would be safe here. Wizards would think twice before storming your mountain for it, even if they knew where it was in the first place. It doesn't exonerate me, but at least the Kingmaker's sword wouldn't be put to foul use again. The Kingmaker's sword, Virak repeated, lifting his head in interest. That is a name I haven't heard in centuries. Jeez, am I the only one who doesn't know about this thing? Gretchen shook her head. I need to figure out a way to get rid of it. Then maybe, when I hand the pouch over, it'll prove I don't have a collection of murder weapons inside. But my friend, Elod, if they're saying he's dead, they could very well mean to do away with him. I can't let that happen either. You would like to leave this sword in my keeping? Virag snorted a puff of smoke. It is no treasure I would wish to keep. Perhaps when I was younger and took greater pleasure in such coveted relics, but in my twilight years, keeping a swarm of angry mages at bay doesn't sound as fun as it used to. But I would still do you a service. Let me incinerate this bag of yours. No! Gretchen snatched the pouch to her chest and gritted her teeth. I'm not giving up my whole livelihood for this. My entire store of potions is inside this thing. Without it, there's no way I could run a business from the city marketplace and have enough time to brew the stock at home. Then you must get this Elod to remove the sword, Virag said matter-of-factly. Yeah, Gretchen rolled her eyes. Break into a prison designed to hold wizards. 
Even I'm not stupid enough to think that could ever end well. Unless... Gretchen blinked, recalling the dizzying method of travel at Virag's disposal. Would you lend me your portal stone? I should think such a stone wouldn't work within a mage's walls, Virag rumbled. Even if they did, without knowledge of its layout, you'd be just as likely to materialise inside a stone wall. Gretchen thought about the room at the academy, kept for the specific purpose of portal stone travel. It made sense they would ward the rest of the building against such haphazard travel, but it still left her with an impossible task. I don't suppose you feel like making a scene with me at their guild? Vera only chuckled, and Gretchen's mouth curved in a small smile despite herself. The spectacle would be like nothing the citizens of Helgard had ever seen. But to get into the tower, she would need to keep her pouch out of reach. It left her with limited options in carrying around an arcane arsenal. OK, can I at least leave the pouch here a while? I'll come back for it. And if I don't turn up after a few weeks, you have my permission to torch it. Vera considered her proposal and gave a slow nod. Perhaps I can do a little more than that, witchling. I'm uncertain that fire would properly dispense of a wizard's work. And even on my mountain, I have no wish to see the world of men fall into madness again. His eyes twinkled with humour. It's bad for business. Gretchen smiled at the memory of her time with the dragon's strange troop of performers, catering to monarchies and staging fake rescue opportunities for not-quite-noble knights. How is business, anyway, keeping you in plenty of livestock? Mandel brought a fresh flock of goats this week past. I look forward to picking them off one by one. Gretchen noted the scorched bones littering the cave floor. So, any suggestions? I have a tooth. The sound of Virag's voice was thick, as though he was probing around his mouth with his tongue. It has been giving me some trouble. Should you prize it out, I'll let you keep it. Gretchen tried to keep her lip from curling at the thought of playing dragon dentist, but knew a dragon tooth must have some magical properties. And what will a dragon tooth do for me, exactly? Why, luck, of course. Virag snaked his head closer. How did you think dragons age? With every lost tooth, we reduce our luck until we are gummy lizards left to expire. Sheesh! Well, I hope you take dental hygiene seriously. Gretchen wondered over the offer and hoped an extraction wouldn't shave years off his lifespan. So, your tooth will make me lucky. It would have to be pretty extraordinary. It will, if only temporarily, cause fortune to bend to your will as it were. I wouldn't recommend that you bang on the doors to demand they set your friend free... But any effort at subterfuge and sneaking inside would have a higher probability of success. Gretchen thought of what she had on hand, which could be of use. She'd blown the last of her invisibility potion when setting the Arctic elves free, and glamour powder would only get her so far. But she knew green speckled mushrooms grew in the nearby woods, and their best known use aided a potion which could transform. All right, I think I know what to do. Gretchen stood with a finger held up. I hope your tooth isn't bothering you too much. It'll take me a while to get this potion right. Virag's eyes glittered, and he gave a toothy grin. Take your time, witchling. Chapter 5 Making a complicated potion with improvised utensils in a dragon's cave had Gretchen cursing over her spellbook and flinging makeshift bone paddles over her shoulder. Virag spent the time dozing, only cracking his eye open occasionally with a smirk. So far, she'd used up an entire treasury's worth of green speckled mushrooms in her attempt to craft a transformation elixir, and the instructions contained in her spellbook were vague, to say the least. Don't know why I bothered lugging the darn thing all this way? She glared at the tome, which seemed to snicker at her, full of mumbo-jumbo and nonsense. What is it you are trying to achieve, witchling? An elixir of transformation, Gretchen spat. Theoretically, I should be able to turn myself into a greybeard and disguise myself as a wizard. The ingredients are so darn expensive, though. It's never been something I've dabbled in. It was just lucky that she had preserved stamens of the night-blooming cereus flower in her stores. She'd meant to sell them when she had an opportunity but had forgotten about them in her last argument with her local alchemist. The fire is too hot, Virag remarked, and you mustn't use those stalks, just the tops and chop them finely. 
Gretchen screwed up her face and looked between the battered tin pot she was using over the fire and the dragon's bemused expression. What would you know about brewing potions? Ah. Virag grinned and flicked his tail. I had the company of an accomplished witch for a time, centuries ago now. She always said dragon fire burned hotter than a hearth. Gretchen rolled her eyes and rummaged in her pouch for a fire charm. Fine, I'll... let me. Virag got to his feet and trod further into the cave. Gretchen frowned but followed, and the dragon stopped at a rock with a deep depression on top. It looked more like a carved bowl, and with a snort of flame, Virag heated it. As the dragon made his way back to his resting place, Gretchen blinked against the gloom and retrieved a light charm to illuminate the space. Old ceramic pots sat on a natural shelf in the cave wall, and a flat bench beside the bowl made the space look like a kitchen of sorts. Thanks for not telling me about this sooner, Gretchen muttered, as she fetched her ingredients and set to work preparing them. After schooling her mind to calm and achieving a trance-like state, Gretchen readied the brew and left it to bubble gently. The colour was better, as was the consistency, and it reduced to a thinly viscous elixir with a faint greenish tinge from the mushrooms. Still uncertain if it would work, Gretchen painstakingly collected it from the bowl with a bottle and decided it would be best to wait until she got to the city to test it out. She wasn't certain how long it would last, and popping into her regular visage surrounded by those who would do her harm didn't sound appealing. Success? Vera asked as she returned to the fire. I think so. Gretchen began transferring supplies from her pouch to the satchel she'd lugged along with her. Getting around without her pouch had her feeling vulnerable, and she wondered what else she should take with her. Her spell book, probably, just in case. How long is this tooth going to work for anyway? Not long, I should think, Virag rumbled, as though he was thinking. Perhaps you should take the portal stone, not to get inside this tower, but somewhere nearby. Gretchen stopped pawing through her satchel and stared at the dragon. He owed her nothing, but was offering a great deal to aid her quest. The life of a dragon must be lonely, she thought. She regretted not having visited more often to share a cup of tea and overcooked goat with the guy. You're a good friend, Vera. Don't read too much into it, he snorted. Can't have you sorcerer types gaining too much power. Why, they might get it into their heads that dragons should be subservient to them. Glorified mounts to ferry them about and burn villages on command. Gretchen couldn't imagine a world where dragons got pushed around like that, but perhaps it had come close when the Kingmaker's sword was last in circulation. I won't let that happen. Excellent, now come pry this tooth out. I've had a headache for days. The work of pulling out a rotten dragon tooth was every bit as treacherous as Gretchen thought it would be. As careful as Virak was, his scorching breath was only countered by the copious amount of slobber pooling in his mouth as Gretchen yanked and wriggled the tooth loose. It wasn't as big as she thought it would be, maybe the length of her boot, and the old guy looked like he had plenty of chompers to spare. He gave an appreciative grunt and flexed his jaw as Gretchen inspected a particularly nasty-looking cavity at the base of the tooth. It didn't look lucky, but she trusted Virag's word. With her spellbook and an assortment of clinking bottles in her satchel, she stowed the tooth under her belt against her spine. Virag nosed around a pile of bones until the bluish glimmer of the portal stone was visible. I hope you are ready, he rumbled. Must I explain how this works? Nah. Gretchen picked up the stone and waved a hand. All I have to do is think of the destination and... Having pictured the interior of the mud hut that was her imagined refuge, the portal stone whipped her away into the space in between, where it felt like her insides were turned out and flung across an endless void. It figured the first time she'd been at the helm of such a device, she would make a fool of herself. And if she thought the last few times were rough, this trip was near excruciating. She landed on the packed dirt floor with a thud, her vision swimming with colours. Good grief! came a voice from somewhere behind. You mean to give me an apoplexy, mistress? Apologies, Gretchen groaned as she rolled into a ball on her side. The mud hut lurched around to the backflips of her stomach. Give me a minute. Mindful that the old woman was likely considering whether to send for help, she pushed herself up to sit and hugged her knees to her chest. The woman sat bundled by the fire. Her complexion improved from the last time she'd seen her despite the apparent fright. 
I don't mean to use your home as some kind of halfway house. Gretchen blinked to clear her vision. But I'm afraid I had no choice. Never you mind that, she tutted. I know important business when I see it, and after that lad said the Chancellor had sent him herself, I knew what you were about must be... Chancellor, Gretchen frowned. I don't suppose you mean Vice-Chancellor? Perhaps. The woman stood to put a kettle over the fire. The hut remained warmer since Gretchen had set the arcane fire, and blinking at the flames, she could see traces of blue-green nestled in around the coals. The message? Well, I suppose it'll make sense to you. She tapped the side of her nose with a finger and winked. Nothing written down, mind. Ah, let me see. The troll reports the cottage has been raised. The cat is well. Oh, and that things are heating up. I suppose that's all just double meaning, hmm? The weather's still bitter, and I've never heard of a troll giving reports before. Jurgen said they raised the cottage. Her cottage. The wizards burnt it to the ground? But how would he know? He didn't visit all that often, and... Gretchen choked back a cry and dragged fingernails over her cheeks. Of course, he would have gone to check things out after the message she'd sent with Monty. Telling Cordelia about it would have been the next logical thing to do when he didn't find Gretchen at the academy. But it was absurd. Ransacking, she expected. Torching the place when they didn't find what they were looking for was beyond extreme. Rocking back and forth, Gretchen held back the torrent of emotion threatening to spill over. Not good news, H.M. The old woman clucked. Well, let's just get a nice cup of tea ready, shall we? Gretchen could barely bring herself to nod in polite acknowledgement. Instead, an unbidden flood of memories flashed in her mind of the life she'd spent in that run-down old cottage. Gretchen and Cordelia had gone to live with Aunt Esme when they were both small, spent a happy childhood and a regular turbulent adolescence calling the place home. Even when Aunt Esme had taken the post at the Witches' Academy, the walls of the place still seeped with a homey presence. It felt almost like a part of the family. And now it was gone. Shock and grief hardened to anger, and Gretchen pushed herself to her feet. Wizards. Petulant children who would destroy their own toys before letting another play with them. They were going all out in their blunt attack, painting her as a murderess, keeping her from the academy, seeking to destroy everything in life she held dear. Sword aside, she had a score to settle with this new grand wizard. After Elod was safe, she meant to rain down fire and brimstone on anyone who got in her way. Mistress? The old woman cocked her head. Can I get you anything? Gretchen blinked and turned to the woman who seemed to shrink away from her. Belatedly, she realised she had teeth bared and smoothed her features over with a shudder. No time, but thanks. Virag's talk of luck bubbled to the surface of her mind. She didn't feel particularly lucky given the news, but she supposed she would need to get going if she meant to harness every ounce of good fortune the tooth could afford her. Swinging her satchel around, she first took a long swing of a hay fever brew to keep her nose from betraying her in the company of wizards, then considered the transformation elixir. With such strong feelings swirling inside her mind, Gretchen concentrated as she uncorked the bottle. She imagined a vague outline of a stooped old man with a long beard, then infused it with need. Someone that every wizard would fear as soon as they saw him. Formidable. A man even the arcane constabulary would let pass without question. She tipped her head back to down the elixir in one gulp and waited with eyes closed for the transformation to begin. And it wasn't pretty. Bone snapping, muscle spasms, and the feeling of skin being stretched and withered kept Gretchen from thinking too much about the hair sprouting from her chin. Virak had supplied her with robes his troop of performers kept on hand, and as she filled her work dress she hastened to strip free of it and into the loosely fitting white garb. The old woman watched on with a mix of abject horror and fascination, her cheeks not even colouring at the sight of a naked old man standing in her home. But after Gretchen cinched a belt around her skinny bent frame, the woman found her voice again. Never in all my years did I think such a thing was possible, you really must be very powerful. Trickery no more, Gretchen's masculine voice sounded. May I borrow your walking stick? Acquiring that many extra years in a few seconds is brutal. The old woman cackled as she hobbled to the fire and proffered a well-worn stick. Gretchen took it gratefully with a wince and rubbed the small of her back. Please, I would appreciate it if nobody knew of my arrival. 
Or this, Gretchen waved at her new body with a lopsided smile. You have my word, mistress. The woman bobbed in deference. Glad to be of service. There was no help for leaving through the front door. It was the only one in the mud hut, and Gretchen hoped any sticky beaks would assume the old gal had gotten herself a wizardly paramour, shuffling along at high speed, which resembled nothing even close to a brisk walk. Gretchen made her way into the city proper, practising glares along the way at those who stared too long and brandishing the walking stick like a lethal weapon. Gretchen marvelled at its cowing effect on the public. She hoped her passing would be just as fortunate when she got inside the wizard's tower. Chapter 6 As luck would have it, Gretchen's reception at the Wizard's Hall was even more deferential. Wizards and acolytes alike blanched when they saw her face and scurried aside to let her pass. Gretchen's problem was the layout, and even with the hay fever dose she felt her nose drip. Boy! She grabbed a youngster by the scruff of the neck and narrowed her eyes at his frightened face. Lead me to the tower. Although the demand left the poor kid looking confused, he nodded, and Gretchen hobbled after him through hallways leading in all directions. There was no way she would have found her way around the place with an invisibility potion and guesswork, and she was glad the transformation spell had worked. Though the more she frowned at passers-by who seemed shocked by her presence, the more she wondered at the face she wore. She'd hoped to leave less of an impression as she passed through. Soon the boy stopped by a pair of double doors. He bowed deeply and opened the left side, apparently leaving Gretchen to continue alone. Supposing they'd reached the tower and one of his stature wasn't permitted inside, Gretchen had to stop herself from thanking the kid as she shuffled past, her walking stick clicking along on the marble floors. The tower was notorious as both the prison and vault of the Wizards' Guild, presumably with the inmates kept on the lower levels. She hoped so at least, with her old creaking knees protesting at the injustice of her journey so far. Her question was answered when she reached a guard at another set of double doors, sitting behind a desk much like a clerk over a stack of papers. Grand, none of that, Gretchen barked as she thumped the walking stick on the desk. You let me buy at once and there's nothing more to speak of. The guard swallowed and produced a key from his belt as he rushed to open the doors. Of course, should you need... Give me the keys. Gretchen fought to keep a severe stare on her features as she held her hand out. All of them. Whoever Gretchen had assumed in identity must have been important, as the guard handed them over with a bow, stammering apologies. Either that, or she'd underestimated the dragon tooth's potency. Leaving the guard by the door, Gretchen continued into the hallways beyond, wondering whether she should have questioned the guard on where Elod was being kept. But even that felt too risky. As a supposedly dead man, she had to assume he was being held in the utmost secrecy. The layout of the prison was straightforward as far as cells went, and pretty ordinary looking in Gretchen's estimation. Drips from cracks in the mortar felt like any other regular prison she'd been in, though perhaps they were charmed to give off an ambiance of despondency and doom. A grate in each of the doors allowed guards to see inside each cell without the inconvenience of the prisoner likewise being able to see their captors. Each time Gretchen pressed her nose to such a grate, the scraggly occupants didn't so much as look up. But she didn't see any guards on duty in the hallways, which felt less like luck and more like a bad omen. The uneasy feeling in her stomach was rewarded with further disquiet, when her muscles rippled underneath loose skin. The elixir was already wearing off, and it could take a good time yet to find Elod's cell. Shuffling a little more carefully, lest the contractions inside her skin cause her a fall, Gretchen dragged a sleeve over her clammy forehead and made a silent plea to the tooth pressing into her spine. Let the next cell be Elod's. The next step she took left her feeling dizzy, and she thought the torch sconce in the wall seemed different. The hallway was darker, and she wondered whether she'd been transported in a single step to the location of Elod's cell. If she'd have known the tooth would be so obliging, she would have entreated the charm the minute she got to the city. But there was only one way to find out if the next cell was Elod's, so she rushed forward and peered inside. Elod sat on a narrow bed with his eyes closed, his face a picture of calm. Gretchen gasped as her bones twisted and snapped, 
and she panted as she rummaged with the keys in her sweaty palms. She only had to try three of the slender crystalline keys before the mechanism glowed green and swung silently inward. Gretchen lurched through to lean against the stone wall and the door clicked softly closed behind her. Gretchen? Elod cocked his head. I'd ask why you're wearing a beard, but perhaps that's a question best left for another time. The final convulsions of the spell wearing off kept Gretchen from a sharp retort, and she bit back a cry as her spine straightened and her skin shrank back against her smaller form. The beard fell away in singed chunks, and Gretchen scratched her cheeks furiously to be rid of the itchy mess. Manly parts turned back into lady parts, and Gretchen shuddered in revulsion. I'm never taking another one of those elixirs again. Gretchen held a hand to her chest and reined in her breathing. But I'm glad to see you're still in one piece. Marching right into the wizard's tower, hmm? I considered whether you would try your hand at freeing me, but I never thought you'd make such an attempt in broad daylight. Gretchen frowned at the lighting in the room, which glowed from a magical sphere. How can you tell the difference between night and day in here? Elod blinked, and his bushy eyebrows furrowed. Surviving captivity is an exercise of extreme willpower. Once the day's muddy into an infinite stretch of time, you may as well give up. Yeah, about that. Gretchen glanced at the grate in the door and noted the blur of the hallway beyond. I've been accused of your murder, Elod. They can't mean to turn you loose after this. Probably more likely to see you as a problem to take care of. Gretchen dragged a thumb across her throat to illustrate her point. But the old wizard didn't appear perturbed. Never mind that. Do you have the sword? Course I do. Not like I could get the darn thing out of my pouch. What we need to do is get you out of here so we can... Give it to me. Elod held out a hand. Gretchen snorted and shook her head. You really think I would be stupid enough to bring the Kingmaker's sword into this viper's pit? No, I'm keeping it someplace safe. What I need to know is whether a portal stone will work in here, and if not, how to get out of here as quickly as possible. Gretchen thought she saw a flash of irritation cross Elod's features, but then his face twisted in concentration. Not in the tower, of course. It is warded against all forms of travel. But in other parts of the hall, travelling is permitted. It is only arriving, which must take place in the room set aside for that purpose. Then we better get moving. I don't know what the heck is going on out there. The guards might have stopped for a lunch break or something, but I didn't run into a single jailer since coming into the tower. Strange. Elod stood and brushed imagined dust from his drab grey robes. You must have brought a bit of good luck along with you. Gretchen opened her mouth to tell Elod about the tooth, but it only reminded her that it too was running out of time. Instead, she opened the cell's door and poked her head into the hall beyond. It was empty, and she waved at Elod to get moving. Come on, I can tell you all about it once we're out of this forsaken place. Despite Elod's grey beard and wizened face, Gretchen had always thought the guy was pretty spry on his feet, and he didn't slow her down as they hurried down each passage. Stopping only to listen to the sound of footfalls at each intersection and peek around the corner, they remained unhindered in their trek back toward the entrance. It was decidedly further than Gretchen remembered it, but Elod seemed confident they were headed in the right direction and gave her a grin when they rounded the last corner toward the double doors. Jeez, how much time have you actually spent down here? Gretchen pulled the portal stone from her oversized white robes, keeping it shrouded in a fold of her sleeve, lest she accidentally attempt to port somewhere and set off an alarm. That was worse than the labyrinth. Wizards have an excellent sense of direction. Lod's voice was dismissive. Now let's get going. I know there's a guard on the other side of that door, even if all the others have abandoned their posts. As soon as we're through, take my hand and we'll be out of here. Where is our intended destination? Elod caught her sleeve. Gretchen cast around the empty hallway, but still couldn't shake her sense that something wasn't right. Perhaps there was a different kind of surveillance going on. Doesn't matter, come on. The fifty or so yards to the doors were excruciating, but had nothing to do with Gretchen's wobbly legs. Sweat beaded on her brow, and she clutched the portal stone tight with fear. But Elod shouldered through the door and reached for her hand as he crossed the threshold. Fumbling to get the stone into her sweaty palm, 
Gretchen barely registered the look of shock on the guard's face and concentrated on Virag's cave. Scorched goat bones, a cheery fire and... Elod's grip tightened on hers as they crossed into the place between where blinding light seared and they stretched across the vast distance. In a dizzying whirl, they landed hard on the stone floor of the cave, Gretchen's limbs twisted with Elod's. Oh, Gretchen wriggled free. I hate portal stones. Her one white robes were now caked with dust and ash, and Gretchen swatted at them fruitlessly as she lamented leaving her dress behind at the old woman's hut. She could use a long bath and a stiff drink to rid herself of the phantom sensations of wearing a man's body. Elod got to his feet with a wince and turned naturally toward the mouth of the cave, where dusky sunlight penetrated the gloom. And we are... In a dragon's cave, Gretchen spoke matter-of-factly. Though it looks like the dragon in question is off catching a goat. I'm starving. I reckon I could abide a roast dinner, even if it was a little burnt. Elod gave her a queer look and shook his head. The sword? You know, for someone who has put me through a considerable amount of trouble, you aren't doing nearly enough explaining. Gretchen planted her hands on her hips. The minute I go back into the city, I'll be arrested for your murder. Now, I reckon they'll have a hard time making a convincing argument at trial if you turn up. But that doesn't solve the real problem here. Elod blinked, and Gretchen growled in irritation. Those thugs raised my cottage! Gretchen choked up, an entire lifetime of memories up in smoke. They'll do anything to get their mitts on this stupid sword, and before I hand it over, I want to know what you propose to do with it. Elod puffed out his moustaches and advanced on her. I'll destroy it. Then we can return to the city and clear your name. If he could destroy the sword, Gretchen thought, then why hadn't he done exactly that instead of hiding it in her pouch? How? Gretchen took a few backward steps, fighting a sense of dread. Elod's lip curled just as a ring on his finger flared with a green light. His features twisted and rearranged themselves. His wispy grey beard shortened into a darker shade. Milky kind eyes turned round and piggy. Gretchen squawked in alarm as she backed into a stalagmite, and the not Elod figure laughed mirthlessly. Give me the sword, wench! He leered, exposing his teeth. Before I set you alight... Chapter 7 I don't think so. Gretchen turned and bolted further into the cave, hoping to find a place to hide. She knew where the pouch was located, but didn't want to lead the wizard, who she presumed with Morath, to it. I'm sure you thought your plan was rather ingenious, Morath called out. That you really believed one could breach the tower unnoticed shows just how inferior you witches are. I suspected you would turn up sooner rather than later after we found that old fool in a trance, though I never would have guessed you'd be wearing my predecessor's face. Gretchen pressed herself against the cave wall, hoping the inky blackness would shroud her. But what had they done with Elod after that? Was he really dead, just as they claimed? You don't really think we keep prisoners of that calibre among thieves and degenerates, he hissed or that our guards would abandon their stations on anything other than a direct order from their grand wizard. Dragon's tooth! My foot! Gretchen cursed. And where was the big guy, anyway? Gretchen scrambled to figure out what to do, but knew she had nothing on her person which would come close to disarming a wizard. But she did have... Closing her eyes, Gretchen clutched the portal stone and imagined the pouch. Uncertain that the stone would work in such proximity, her conviction wavered, and the stone flared with a blue light, then dimmed again. It was enough to give away her location, and Gretchen scrambled to move further into the cave. You have two choices, Morath called out. You either hand over that pouch and live as an outlaw, or I slaughter you and find it in this hole myself. Gretchen chose a third option. While she was pretty sure that the sword couldn't be destroyed, she thought she could keep it out of the hands of wizards and witches alike. Lunging forward to where the stone bowl and stores of the long-dead resident witch lay, she fumbled on the shelf as ceramic pots shattered on the ground. Right at the back, Gretchen stood on tiptoes to hook a finger through one of the laces. A flare of green light told Gretchen Morath wasn't far behind. Reefing her pouch down, she swung around to face Morath with wild eyes. Smart choice! I won't belittle you for cowardice! Morath held out a hand. How long have you known the sword was in here? 
A hunch. Morath shrugged. The self-righteous fools who gave up our most valuable asset tried their best to expunge the sword's fate from history, but I finally came by an account that placed the sword in the Firemount family, for safekeeping as it were. I frequented Elod's little shop of junk, and the only item the man ever refused to sell was that cursed bag. Then he sold it to me, Gretchen mused, but she had her answer. From there she could fill in the blanks, a steady rise to power, the ultimate takeover, putting the thumbscrews on poor Elod. And now you have the means to rule the world, huh? Gretchen rolled her eyes, then did something she thought with half a mind could very well bring the entire cave down around her ears. With two hands, she pulled the pouch open, then wrenched until stitching popped, and the magical seam that held her infinite storeroom burst in a booming explosion. Blinding white light seared her eyes, and the force of the blast threw her back against the wall. With the wind punched from her lungs, Gretchen crumpled to the floor, the deafening sound pierced by a cry of fury. She'd at least half hoped that the destruction of her pouch would subdue her assailant so she could make a break for it. But it appeared she would have no such luck. Harridan, he roared. I shall make your death slow and painful. You have cursed us all to subservience and ruin. Gretchen rolled clear as green flame flared in her direction and pushed onto her feet to stumble forward on wobbly legs. The cave was no refuge. If she wanted to shake Morath, her best bet was on the mountainside where dragon magic may aid her. Wondering where the scaly guy was anyhow, she wove as best she could to avoid the scorching flames aimed in her direction. She wasn't entirely successful. Searing pain on her leg almost brought Gretchen to her knees accompanied by the stench of singed wool as she neared the cave's mouth. Gritting her teeth, she took the last few steps into daylight and took an unjustified breath of relief before realising the chase had only just begun. Sheltering trees stood on the other side of a small clearing, or she could take her chance with the newly rebuilt rope bridge spanning over the chasm, which led to a lone tower. Rope burned quicker than wood, Gretchen reasoned and she hobbled as quickly as she could toward the trees. The sweetest sound she ever heard came, though, and the wind picked up as an outraged, serpentine shriek shook tree branches. Virak's form swooped down, and Gretchen dropped to the ground with hands over her head. In a contest of fire, Gretchen knew Morath didn't stand a chance, and even before Virak touched down to stand over her, the heat of his flames filled the clearing. Gretchen rolled to her side to look back, and the cave mouth glowed like an inferno. Virak stomped forward, flames dancing away from his shiny scales, and continued spewing fire until Gretchen caught a morbid whiff of roasting meat. The screams were worse, and Gretchen rolled back over to bury her head until the whole ugly business was over. She had sunk into a deep well of misery when Virak snuffled her leg and flinched in surprise when she realised he'd begun licking her wounds. Hey! Gretchen scrambled away, but her eyes boggled as burning pain turned to strange tingling. Give me your leg, Virag's tongue flickered. If I don't do this quickly, it will never heal properly. With a mixed sense of awe and disgust, Gretchen yielded and peeled the white robes aside. Virag's ministrations healed her injuries within minutes, with raw red skin turning pink and smooth. Gretchen flexed and rubbed her leg, then stood to draw a deep breath through her nose. Thanks. Aware that her flat tone sounded ungrateful, Gretchen summoned a half-smile for the dragon. I would have been toast if you didn't arrive. You are not exuberant with victory, witchling, Vera grumbled. Did this Elod betray you? That wasn't Elod, Gretchen frowned. That was the guy who wanted the sword. Elod is probably dead. I destroyed my pouch. My home is gone. And I reckon even my broom is a pile of ash in there. Ah, Virag's nostrils twitched as he followed Gretchen's gaze into the cave. Most likely, but the kingmaker's sword is finally gone, and the one who besmirched your name is dead. Shall I rip his head off for you to present to his peers? Ick! Gretchen pulled a face. What is it with heads at the moment? No, but he did have something... Gretchen held a fold of her oversized robes to her nose as she picked her way over hot rocks in Virag's cave. She wasn't sure that Morath's head could have been identified in its blackened state, but the ring on his middle finger still glimmered. She assumed its magical properties kept it safe from the flames. 
With trepidation, she pulled it free from brittle fingers and hurried out before her boots could start smouldering. She held it up for Virag to peer at, and the dragon nodded his approval. A token, then, he rumbled. Wait here, witchling. I shall return directly. Gretchen frowned quizzically, but backed away to the rocky wall surrounding the cave as Virag returned to the skies. Finding a shady log to slump onto, she considered her situation. All she had on her person was borrowed robes and a portal stone. She had some things in safe keeping with the old woman. Thankfully, her hat and dress among them, but that seemed like a minor concession. Her home and business had gone up in flames. Ironically, the very element which had saved her from likewise being scattered in a cloud of ash. With the probability of Elod's death, she was just as likely now to stand accused of two murders instead of one. Even her own guild would condemn her actions in keeping the sword from them. Her greatest regret, though, was what it all meant for Piper. She had a responsibility to the girl, and now she barely had the means to keep her cat fed. With no apparent solutions, tears flowed down Gretchen's cheeks until Vera returned with three huddled shapes on his back. The familiar faces, all three forms almost indistinguishable from each other, were a strangely welcome surprise. The Corley brothers. Wizards of the lowest order, part of Mandel's band of performers, who preferred to call themselves Illuminators. While they didn't cause her nose to itch, they could pull off some impressive stunts. They nodded in greeting, the lot of them a quiet bunch, and took down hampers to lay out a meal of roasted goat and bottles of wine from the abandoned fort's cellar. Gretchen assumed the dragon had told the brothers everything so tucked into a meal which seemed better suited to a victorious feast. Virach sat watching them, bathing his scales in the afternoon sun, and waited for Gretchen to wipe her mouth and lean back before speaking. We have fresh garb for you, witchling. The brothers will escort you back to the city with a declaration on my behalf, if you wish. I would not have my handiwork misrepresented among your kind. He would take responsibility for Morath's death, Gretchen realised, and sniffled at another wave of unbidden emotion. Should you find you have nowhere else to go, I offer you sanctuary here. The tower is sound and has enough accommodations to see you in relative comfort. The offer was tempting. If she only had herself to think of, she might very well have taken Virak up on it, but it was too far from Piper's studies, and even without a house, Edgewater would always be her home. Thank you, Virach. Her lips trembled as she stood. Perhaps I might come by every so often for a vacation at the tower, but I need to sort out this mess first. Very well, the dragon rumbled. I shall orate my account. One of the Corley brothers handed her a soft grey robe, and she traded it for the portal stone before going into the woods to get changed. She could hear Virag speaking at length, presumably with one of the Corleys scratching away with a quill, but the smell of fresh water called invitingly and she found a small stream where she washed her grimy face and hands and shucked off the filthy and now charred white robes. The new garments were a better fit, and she felt somewhat revived as she rebraided her hair and made her way back to the clearing. On a lap desk, a Corley brother sealed a roll of parchment and corked a pot of ink. The others cleared away the remnants of the meal, and when Gretchen held up the white robes, one brother came forward with a mutter to tuck them away in a basket. Nodding her thanks, she stood shuffling her feet as she waited, wondering which of the brothers would take her to the city. Virag scratched at a dull patch of scales, very much resembling Mulligan with his tongue lolling out his mouth, and it all felt very ordinary given the gravity of the situation. You are ready? The Corley brother with the scroll stood and inclined his head. Yep. Gretchen had already given some thought to where they should land within the city, and held out her hand for the stone but I doubt you've ever seen the inside of the academy, much less the portal room. The Corley brother's expression didn't change, but Gretchen thought he paled a little. Virag chuckled softly, and the illuminator handed over the stone. Goodbye, Vera. Gretchen smiled as she clamped a hand on the Corley brother's shoulder. Thanks for everything. The clearing melted away, and Gretchen fought the nauseating sensation of being flung across the world. Chapter 8 The portal room in the academy was empty and dim, 
and Gretchen groaned as she stood before handing the portal stone back to the wary illuminator. More used to the dizzying form of travel, he was already on his feet, casting suspicious eyes around as though waiting for all witch kind to descend on him. She didn't have time to reassure the guy. Gretchen jerked her head toward the door and led them out and upward toward Cordelia's study. The early evening hour wasn't conducive to remaining unseen, and the eyes of witches they passed boggled in their wake. But Gretchen wasn't about to stop and explain herself to everyone, and had to expect the wizards would hear of her arrival soon. The risk of exposing herself was rewarded when Gretchen burst into Cordelia's study to find her sister poring over ledgers, and she dropped her quill in surprise. Flying out of her seat, she enveloped Gretchen in a hug, and the two of them clung together, talking over the top of one another. The cottage, pouch destroyed. Cordelia stepped back while gripping Gretchen's shoulders and blinked rapidly. The sword, gone. Gretchen pulled Morath's ring from her pocket, along with Morath's nightstaff. Cordelia glanced at the Corley brother lingering in the doorway and composed herself within seconds, her hands clasped in front of her and a penetrating stare levelled. And who is this? Illuminator Corley. The Illuminator inclined his head. Representative of the mighty dragon Virak. Cordelia's face registered shock, and she swung back to Gretchen. You must tell me everything, quickly, before the very council comes to bang down the door. As succinctly as she could, Gretchen recounted her trip to Virag's cave, the use of the portal stone, and the transformation spell to get inside the wizard's tower. When she got to the part when Morath revealed himself in the cave, she dropped his ring on Cordelia's desk. I couldn't let him have it, so I ripped the pouch open, and it exploded. It was lucky Virag turned up when he did. Otherwise Morath would have incinerated me. But Elod, Cordelia, there's no chance. A banging came at Cordelia's door, and a reedy voice of fury sounded behind it. Open up at once, chairwoman Inglewood barked. Sister or no, this is a council business. Cordelia pressed the ring into Gretchen's palm and mouthed Elo. Gretchen blinked, then slipped it onto her finger. With no other clue to how such a charm worked, she pictured her old friend in her mind's eye and felt a tingling on every inch of her skin. Cordelia opened the door and bowed her head, and chairwoman Marion Inglewood stepped inside with a face as red as a beet. Why? As her eyes settled on Gretchen, the woman recoiled. Not feeling different in form, Gretchen held a hand up and gasped in dismay at her own fingers unchanged, but chairwoman Inglewood held a hand to her mouth, and her eyes glittered with tears. My dear Elod, she gasped, so it isn't true, then? Illusion, Gretchen reasoned, and drew a deep breath through her nose. Marion! Gretchen hoped Elod was likewise on first-name terms with the crone. It would take more than an upstart wizard to get the better of me. But where? Chairwoman Inglewood blinked and glanced around the room. Where is Gretchen? She was seen marching up here. A ruse, Cordelia piped up. My sister is being held in the tower. We must demand her release now that Elod has dealt with Morath. Nice one, Gretchen thought, though she figured her sister would be in a world of trouble when Marion Inglewood learned of the real ruse. This is all very irregular, Chairwoman Inglewood snapped. You shall tell me what is going on this very instant. Come along, Marion. Gretchen took the woman's elbow and turned her toward the door. Time is of the essence. All shall be revealed. Cordelia opened the door to a gaggle of witches nosing around in the hallway. Chairwoman Inglewood evidently decided against the indignity of an argument and allowed herself to be escorted along. Gretchen nodded at witches with mouths agape at their strange procession and glanced over her shoulder at the Corley brother who followed from behind wearing a private smirk. Not sure exactly what her sister had planned, Gretchen hoped they weren't simply arriving early to her awaiting trial. She caught sight of Piper on their way to the ground floor and winked at her smiling face as she peered around a corner. The kid would think it's Elod, but at least she knew things were progressing. The face of the chairwoman kept them from being detained by anyone on the way to the Wizards Guild under lamplight. Even at their more leisurely pace, they were soon marching up a set of marble steps toward the entrance to their hall. Gretchen hoped it would be Cordelia doing the talking, and her sister didn't let her down when a young wizard in the entryway stammered an inquiry and looked anywhere other than Elod's face. You shall summon your assembly at once. 
you may announce that Chairwoman Marion Inglewood, Vice Chancellor Merkwood, and Cordelia's brow creased slightly. Master Corley, representative of the mighty dragon Virak, demands they convene immediately. Oh, and Elod Firemount. The wizard your order claims is dead. The wizard swallowed and seemed undecided on whether to leave them there unattended to follow Cordelia's instructions or lead them somewhere to wait. But Cordelia had pitched her voice loud enough to be heard across the entryway and an older wizard approached, his face marginally more composed. Please, come this way. He bowed his head and held out an arm, then left them in a large room with a round table dominating the space. Pa. Chairwoman Inglewood sank to a chair and waved her hand to indicate the table. I don't care what shape it is. Nothing will convince me that the Guild runs on anything less than a dictatorship. It's Morath we must speak to. The rest of the assembly are merely window dressing. Gretchen shared a look with Cordelia, then cleared her throat. Morath is dead, Marion. He went mad on a quest to seek the Kingmaker's sword. The... The old woman's face creased with confusion. But that's impossible! The sword has been lost for close to a millennium. Even so, Cordelia sat beside Chairwoman Inglewood. Perhaps we should wait for the assembly. It is a long story. The door to the room burst open, and Gretchen turned on her heel to see an elderly man stride in with none of the apparent ailments of old age. Five others followed him, each of them throwing strange looks at Gretchen before finding seats around the table. Marion Inglewood... The elder sat directly across from them and steepled his fingers. What exactly do you think you're playing at? Chairwoman Inglewood's face bloomed with rage. Edgar Stonecrow, I should ask you the same thing. Where is the rest of your number? I won't waste my breath on anything less than a quorum. The man's eyes betrayed his nerves and he cleared his throat. This is all of us. We are in a time of transition. You're fortunate that we were meeting to discuss that very thing. Before Chairwoman Inglewood could speak, Cordelia stood and gave Gretchen a warning look. Elder wizards, we come to demand the release of a prisoner, one who has been unjustly held on the whim of your grand wizard. Gretchen? The last was directed at her, so Gretchen pulled off the charmed ring and held it up with a waggle. Remember this little trinket? Belonged to Morath Nightstaff. I say belonged because the fool was stupid enough to try to execute me in a dragon's lair. Chairwoman Inglewood was among those who gasped in the room, and Gretchen set the ring theatrically down on the table. Now go fetch Elod Firemount. I know he's in here somewhere, and before you carp on about this supposed murder, consider the item you doddering old fool sought. A tightening in the air preceded what looked like a roaring argument on the other side of the table. Some kind of privacy charm by the looks. Gretchen saw Edgar Mouthsword and thought her play had been the right move. If they thought she had it, they might be more agreeable to her terms. Chairwoman Inglewood sat with a stony expression, not deigning to scold either Gretchen or Cordelia while in sight of the wizards. So they waited, and eventually an acolyte summoned on their part left the room under terse instructions. Still, the wizards didn't let down their barrier, and Gretchen finally sat and pushed the ring further down the table in disgust. They were either sending for Elod, if he was alive, or jailers. It was hard to say which. Gretchen did all she could to refrain from fidgeting, but eventually the door swung open and Elod marched in, his face twisting with emotion at the sight of Gretchen, or perhaps Marion sitting beside her. An ear-popping sensation in the air signalled the wizard's return to the meeting, and Elod chose to sit on their side of the round table. The sword. Edgar leaned forward in his seat. Where is it? Gone. Gretchen flashed a nasty grin. The sword that couldn't be broken met its end in an infinity pouch, which is now lost to the ether. It only cost me my house, my livelihood and almost my life. The assembly took a collective breath, almost looking relieved. Gretchen shook her head in disgust and sat back as Cordelia took up the threads of the story to weave them in a way that only she could. She certainly made it sound more epic than Gretchen thought it was. Virag's flowery words offered by the Corley brother complemented the narrative, and Gretchen was thoroughly bored until Cordelia started making demands. Given the Wizard Guild's culpability in such a reckless plot, we will insist on reparations for loss of property as well as reputation. 
you crafted a vicious slur against our guild, and with calculation and cruelty, you destroyed a guildswoman's entire fortune. Gretchen's breath caught as the wizards conceded, and the business of negotiations began. How Cordelia came to climb the Academy's totem pole became apparent in her shrewd bargaining and haggling, worse than the meanest customer in the marketplace. Gretchen's eyes boggled at the sum agreed to for the cottage and its contents, and from what she could understand, a large sum was to go directly to the Academy, along with a public retraction of the arrest warrant. Even Chairwoman Inglewood's time and expertise seemed to be accounted for as a separate expense, which seemed bizarre given the woman had hardly said a word. But when talks moved on to the loss of Gretchen's infinity pouch, Cordelia consulted Elod on its worth, 200 gold pieces. Elod kept a grave face, but the number was over double what Gretchen paid for it. But the method of enchantment is long lost. I should say to properly compensate, the value should be increased. The wizards only nodded to Cordelia's demand for 300 gold pieces, and Gretchen had to slow her breathing to get her hammering heart under control. Elod's face betrayed nothing, but Gretchen wondered about his own losses. What about the Emporium? Gretchen cut Cordelia off, just as she was suggesting an official missive be sent back to Vera, absolving him of any wrongdoing. He might not be a member of our guild, but was a victim of this mess. If there are damages... We'll see to it, Edgar waved a hand irritably. Now, is this settled? We can tease out the particulars at another time. Right now we have a new Grand Wizard to elect. I should think so. Cordelia stood and gave them a prim look. I'll be back in the morning. I expect it will be a long day. Edgar grimaced but nodded, and their party was ushered out of the door. Marion seemed to deflate once out of sight of the wizard's hall, and Elod deftly threaded an arm around hers with a tender look in his eye. Looks like there's a bigger story between those two, Gretchen whispered to Cordelia. Her sister only arched an eyebrow in agreement. You did great in there, sis. It was my home too once. Cordelia's eyes glittered with tears. There isn't a sum in the world which really makes up for its loss. But you are a wealthy woman now, Gretchen. Could you have believed it a week ago? Gretchen snorted. Not even if a flying pig had suggested it. The next day, Gretchen refused the offer to stay at the academy when she learned Jürgen remained in the city to keep abreast of what was happening. Her friend was staying at the Swine and Claw, and when Gretchen went to meet him with Piper in tow, he was chatting with Nelly, the former barmaid of the Sultan Bog, over a tankard of ale. Strange seeing you on this side of the counter, Jürgen! Gretchen poked him in the ribs, and both he and Nelly stood with excited exclamations. Strange, but the service is agreeable. Jürgen said. Gretchen and Piper sat with the pair and repeated the story of the Kingmaker's sword for what felt like the hundredth time. But what about you, Nelly? I haven't seen you since the last time my cottage was in ruins. Nelly blushed. Actually, Jürgen and I were just discussing a return to my old job. The theatre gig has been abysmal since the director retired. Er, uh, that's great. Gretchen scratched the back of her head. I was kind of hoping that with the cottage gone... There's plenty of space. Jürgen ruffled Piper's hair. It'll be nice to have a full house at the tavern for a while. Gretchen wasn't sure that the gruff troll truly meant it, but appreciated the kindness nonetheless. After settling affairs in the city, they all crowded in on Jürgen's sturdy cart, with a much-improved mulligan curled on Piper's lap. The girl hadn't given Gretchen any grief for taking off on her, but she assumed the lecture was coming after the dust had settled. Before leaving the academy, Cordelia pressed a regular pouch of gold into Gretchen's palm as an advance on her settlement, with an agreement she would return in a few days. There was one last thing Gretchen had to do before they journeyed back to Edgewater, so she gave Jürgen directions to the mud hut where the old woman lived. The others remained in the cart outside, Jürgen muttering about the lingering people who stared, and Gretchen tapped on the crude door before going inside. The woman was much as she'd left her and gave a gap-toothed smile from the fireside. So all went well then. Better than expected. Gretchen nodded and pulled out the gold pouch from a pocket in her borrowed grey robes. In large part thanks to you. Er, uh, Mavis. The woman's sallow cheeks coloured. 
always glad to be of service to the Academy. Taking out a handful of gold, she set it carefully on the rickety table and took her hat from a peg on the wall to clamp on her head. You had a hand in saving the entire kingdom, Mavis, and as my fortunes rise, so should yours. Mavis gave shocked protests at the glimmering gold on the table, but Gretchen ignored her as she gathered her things. Leaving the grey robes behind as she climbed back into her work dress, she gave the woman a stern stare. You take that gold and keep it someplace safe. I'd tell you to find a boarding house in the city to stay in, but I reckon you wouldn't leave this place for the palace itself. Mavis went to open her mouth, but Gretchen grinned. I know a home when I see one. Just promise me you'll keep yourself fed and warm before giving the rest away. And you send word to the academy if your chest gives you any trouble. Mavis's eyes shone with tears, and she stumbled over words of thanks. Gretchen held up her hands against the barrage and lugged her bags toward the door. Once she got them into the cart, she went back to slam the door shut with a screech. Stupid old woman, insubordinate at its worst. You should be grateful to serve a witch and I'll have no complaints about it. Gretchen's voice carried and people lingering in the muddy street shot her foul looks. When Piper gave her a questioning look as they trundled away, she leaned close to whisper in her ear. Can't give those thieves and ruffians reason, so go turning her hut upside down looking for a scrap of bread. Piper sagged with relief and snuggled into her shoulder. As they left the city behind on the road home, Gretchen leaned back against a sack of grain and set about having a well-earned nap. Cottage or no, it was a relief to be heading homeward. Thank you for joining me on this epic journey through The Kingmaker's Sword, episode 11 of the Gretchen's Misadventures series. If you've enjoyed the story, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more enchanting readings and fantastical tales. Share your thoughts on this epic misadventure or recommend your favourite fantasy reads in the comments below. Your insights are the magic that keeps this community thriving. If you're ready for more of Gretchen and her mystical escapades, Give this video a thumbs up and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all things magical right here. Until our next adventure, may your books be filled with wonder and your days with magic. Happy reading!